Well, if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Matthew chapter 26 today? Matthew chapter 26. While you're turning there, I just want to give a recap, remind everybody of where we are, especially for our guests this morning. We're going through the Gospel of Matthew, and now we are right at the end, or towards the end, and we are in a very serious, solemn event right now. We're in a very serious moment in the Gospel, and today's story, it is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is praying right before he is betrayed by Judas and arrested. We know that in less than 24 hours, he is going to the cross. We are just a few hours away, in fact. Things are about to escalate from this point very quickly in our story. And starting from this week and moving on, it's really going to be a very serious tone in the gospel. This gives us an opportunity and a time to reflect on what we are reading. It gives us an opportunity to reflect on Jesus going to the cross and why he's going to the cross. Now, last week, what we talked about was um, Jesus standing there with his disciples. And I'm just going to read a couple of these verses because it was short. I'm going to read at verse 31. This is what we talked about last week. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. And so Jesus laying out and knowing in perfect clarity what is about to happen, he tells them that you are all going to stumble because of me. You are going to be offended. And that when that time comes, you are all going to scatter as the shepherd is, is uh, smitten. And um, they all take this very serious stance, especially Peter. And I'm going to focus in on Peter because he plays a big role into today's message. That's why I reread that for you now. Because Peter uh, says that, especially at the end there, verse 35, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Peter says, no, Lord, I will die with you. I will die for you before I would ever deny you. I'm going to be faithful to you. And of course, we know that he fails at that promise. But let's read today's text, and then I'll open us in a word of prayer. And as we read, um, you'll see that Peter kind of fails here once again. And then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Will you pray with me this morning? 
Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to focus in on your word. And Lord, I thank you for all of the many things you have revealed to us through this study and uh, through this series that we have done. Lord, I pray that today is no different. Lord, I pray that you use the foundation that we have built with the rest of the gospel and, and help us to use that through the lens that we see this text through. Lord, help us to continue to build upon this foundation, Lord, as we continue through this book of Matthew. Lord, I pray that you'll give us a deeper understanding, and I pray that your word will touch our hearts the way only your word can. Lord, I ask for your spirit to move here this morning. And as for me, as I stand here and preach, I pray that you will uh, first bring comfort to me as I am sick, and I pray that you bring comfort to my throat. Lord, I pray that you give me the ability to speak here. But most importantly, Lord, I pray that these are your words and not my own. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to see a couple of things in this text today. A couple of key lessons that I hope to get through. The first thing that we're going to see is you're going to see the true humanity of Jesus. I, I hope that this text can reveal to you this true kind of dual nature of Christ. Someone that is fully human and yet still fully God. And you're going to see some of that humanness in him as we read our text. I also pray that we can learn from the example of Jesus. Now, there are two uh, big things, and there's kind of a pattern that happens here in the text as we read. He has an interaction with his disciples, and then he prays. He has an interaction, and then he prays. He has an interaction, and then he prays, and then he has an interaction. That's the, the pattern and the sequence of events that we're going to see. Now, what we see at the end of this is really Jesus going away prepared for what is about to come, and his disciples not. And I pray that as we get through this, you'll understand the difference and how they both got to the positions that they're in. Now it starts in verse 36. He says that then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. Now this is a place that they have uh, been to multiple times. This is a story that it's touched on in all four of the Gospels. And John tells us that this is a place that they went often. This is a place that the disciples, that the apostles of Jesus knew quite regularly or knew well because they went there quite regularly. Jesus often went there to pray. And so they're in this familiar place to them. And he says unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And so what we see is an interaction. That's where it starts. They arrive in a familiar place and he says, tells them to sit there while he goes and prays. Now, I want to be clear here when it says that he is with the disciples. We don't know exactly who he is with other than the three that are named. Uh, Peter, James, and John. The rest, he said, he left sitting there. Judas, we know from our previous text that Judas is not here right now. Judas is not with them. He's off doing his business and next week and at the end of this text, it says that he will come with the soldiers to betray Jesus and hand him over. And so uh, we know that there is a group with him, but he tells them to sit while he goes and prays. And in verse 37, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. And so he is there, and like many of us, when we are in times of great distress, or, you know, we have a lot of anxiety, or, or you know, there's um, a, a big weight kind of on our shoulders, something really bothering us, we seek out those that we are closest with. And so scripture kind of shows us that these three in particular, Peter, James, and John, that Jesus has a special relationship with. Now, he handpicked 12 to be his apostles. 
But yet, even amongst that 12, he kind of had his favorites. And him being in this distress, he tells the others to sit, and he takes these three with him, and he makes a request. And he is sitting there, and he starts to kind of pour out his heart to these people that he cares about the most, and he says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And so he's pouring out his heart. And he's letting it be known to us and to them that he is having a difficult time right now. He is sorrowful. And he is sorrowful because of what is about to come. Him being God in the flesh, knowing exactly what God's, what the Father's plan is, knowing exactly what is to come, knowing that he is going to be betrayed, knowing that in just mere hours that he himself is not going to sleep and rest before it happens. He is just leading up to being betrayed, being on trial, being judged, being convicted, and being crucified. And it's not just the physical weight of everything that is to come that is weighing on him. It is the weight of all of our sin that is about to come upon him that is making him so sorrowful here. And so we see him tell these people, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even on to death, he says that this is a very serious feeling. It feels overwhelming for Jesus. And so he asks that they stay there and they watch with him. And we'll talk about that word watch here in a little bit. It's an interesting one. Then I'm just going to kind of leave it out there as a little nugget that I really want you to think about. What does Jesus mean when he says to watch? And he continues, and it's in verse 39, now we see him go to pray. So he has an interaction, and now he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. That's a powerful prayer. And what we see, for one, is... Jesus being this example to us. That when we are exceedingly sorrowful about something, when we are going through something in our lives, Jesus' example is, well, for one, he got away from a lot of the busyness. Right? They went out to the garden. He went out with people that he was closest to because he wanted their company, he wanted their support, he wanted them to watch with him and to pray with him. But then he said, watch with me, but now I am going to go a little ways away. And one of the other gospels says that he is a, a stone throws away from them. They could, they could see them with their eyes. He was right there, and they watched as he went, and look at his posture of prayer, fell down on his face and prayed. Jesus should be an example to us in moments like this, because there is times for prayer, and in this time, you know, their typical posture of prayer was a little different than ours. When we prayed in service just a little bit ago, nearly everyone in the church did the exact same thing. You closed your eyes, you bowed your head. Some of you may have put your hands together. Some of you may have stuck them in your pockets. I'm bad for that. I'm bad for that because I'm Italian and I talk with my hands. When I'm trying to not talk with my hands, I have to subdue them, right? <laughs> But we all have a certain posture of prayer. Now, their typical posture of prayer was standing upright, their head tilted towards heaven, and their hands out in some way. That was their typical posture. Now, 
This also shows us that there is a time for more intense, deep prayer. Jesus is literally showing to us and giving us the example of falling at the feet of God. Just as you know, we have talked and Scripture talks about us falling at the feet of Jesus. And he goes and he has this posture of humility and, and anguish and he just he falls on his face and he prays. And look at his prayer. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But we know, and he knows, that it's not possible that this cup pass from him. If there was any other way for us to be forgiven, if there was any other way for us to be ransomed, if there was any other way for us to pay the wages of death for our sin and still be in relation and in communion with God, then he would have picked it. But there's a simple lesson here. There is no other way. Jesus, this person that was born of a virgin, born of the Spirit, lived a perfect life, was a perfect Jew, been the perfect example to us. Knowing what is to come, fell at the feet of his Father and said, if it's possible, if there is any other way, Lord, let it be. And what this shows us is that there is no other way except Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the one that said there is no way to the Father except through him. Jesus is the only hope that we have. And we have hope in him because of the end of that prayer. That even though his heart's desire is that this cup was taken from him, he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. That he was exceeding sorrowful about all of this. And it, he uses a term there, this, may this cup be taken from me. What is that cup? And to really understand that, and we're not going to get into it a ton today, you really have to go back to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it talks about the cup as God's wrath being poured out. And what Jesus is facing is exactly that. What Jesus is facing on the cross is taking on that punishment that we deserved, was tasting death, was feeling the wrath of the Father being poured out on him, not for his own sins, but our sins. This is a powerful moment because he is feeling the weight of what is to come. And we see how much it's affecting our Lord, our Messiah, our Savior. And he only has to go through this because I'm a sinner. Because I'm a sinner. And as hard as it was for him to face it, he showed us perfect submission to the Father. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. And see, this teaches us another lesson that, you know, you don't get to pick your lot in life. You don't get to pick the family that you were born into. You don't. You know, you don't, you don't get to pick if you get that disease in your life. You don't get to pick 
You know, there's lots of things in your life that you don't get to pick, that you don't have control over. But what you do have control over is how you live through those moments. And Jesus is a wonderful example here because he didn't get, well, I better not say, I was going to say he really didn't get to pick this. He did pick it because he willingly went. He freely submitted himself to the Father. He freely went to the cross. But he did it because he knew that there was no other way. Jesus didn't get to pick if Adam and Eve ate of that tree. Jesus doesn't get to pick if you use your free will and sin against him. But yet, he submitted himself. And he's an example to us that us in our life, we may not get to pick what it is that we're facing. But when we are facing whatever it is that we're going through, the example to us is to go and fall on our face in front of God. And not just fall on our face in front of God and not just make our request known unto him, which he wants us to do. But then in the end to say, Lord, this is what I want. This is what I hope, Lord. If there's any other way, please change it. Just allow it to be. Yet in the end, not my will be done, but yours. Lord, I submit myself to you. That is our posture of prayer. That is the example that Jesus gives us in this moment. Now, Let's see, let's move on. We have an interaction, a prayer. Now we get another interaction in verse 40. He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And he saith unto Peter, and specifically he calls out Peter because right before this, it was Peter that told him, Lord, I will die before I deny you. He had such conviction that he could follow through. And yet in this moment, right after He couldn't even stay awake when he watched his Lord fall on his face in deep prayer and was deep sorrowful. And he couldn't even stay awake and pray with him or pray for him. He went to sleep. And so Jesus talks to Peter and he said, what? What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This shows us something else about Jesus. When he told them them to watch. And now he says, watch and pray. And then gives us the reason that ye enter not into temptation. See, Jesus wanted to be near and close to Well, the people that he had been ministering to all this time. And I'm sure there was a part of him that was hoping that they were going to be praying for him and helping to strengthen him and and helping to minister unto him. But yet, when it really gets down to it, Jesus wanted them to watch and pray for their sake. That they would not fall into temptation. And he knows that they're going to fall into temptation, right? He already told them that all of you are going to scatter. And specifically you, Peter, three times you're going to deny me. This night, you will deny that you even know me. And yet he's still saying, but I pray that it's not true. And if you will just submit yourself, if you'll just stay awake, if you'll be watchful, If you'll pray, then maybe you will have the strength to resist and you will not fall into temptation. And then he goes and he prays again. But he says something there at the end of that, I guess before I move on from this interaction. He makes a statement, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you can relate to that saying? 
How many times have you been faced with a, a sin in your life and everything in you knows that it's wrong? And you, and you just, you know it, and you may even be telling yourself that it's wrong. But yet there's something that draws you to it. It's like a gravitational pull. It's like something you can't resist. It's like two magnets being pulled together. There is no, no stopping it, it seems like. And I think all of us as humans have felt that. Like all of us have been there at one point in time in our life where you knew something was wrong and you really didn't want to give in to it. At least the spirit didn't want to give in to it. But yet, man, that flesh is strong. And on one hand, you know, it's, it's depicted in movies and shows and specifically old uh, kind of 90s cartoons. I remember that a lot, watching those growing up, where you get a little angel on one side and a little devil on the other, right? Everybody can picture that. And that's really what it's like, is one little voice saying, you know you're not supposed to do that. And then the other little voice saying, yeah, but you know you're going to enjoy it. You know you really want to. Well, you know God's forgiving. And it's everything in you that just, just pulls you towards that sin and that thing that you know is destructive. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And what Jesus is really trying to get them to see here and what he's trying to get us to understand and the big difference between Jesus and the apostles is that they didn't watch they didn't pray. And that term watch, I'll be honest, there's a lot of debate on what he means by that. And I don't really have the answer for you. It's something for us to meditate on. It's something for us to ponder. Something for us to think about. He could have meant watch for the signs as prophecy is fulfilled in front of you. It could be Watch um, for the, the things that are to come that I've told you you're going to struggle with and you may stumble and, and, and you may fall. You know, watch for those things. And maybe watch for our enemies that are currently actively, as we speak, marching towards us. Could be watch for your enemy, Satan, who is right there seeking whom he may devour. I'm not sure exactly what it is we're watching for. I do know that when he uses that term, it's meaning to be alert. To be alert, to be awake, to be mindful, and to be watching. He says, watch and pray. Jesus stayed awake. Jesus fell on his face before the Father. Jesus cried out to God and put his trust in him while the apostles slept. And at the end of this, Jesus is prepared and they are not. You want to weaken the flesh and strengthen the spirit? You want to flip those things? Well, you better fall on your face in front of God. You better follow the advice of Jesus and the example of him and you better pray. Now he continues in verse 42. He says, he went away the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Now look at this progression. As we talk about strengthening ourselves and strengthening the spirit, look at his first prayer. Okay, his first prayer in verse 39. He says, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as that will. And then he goes and he talks to his disciples and he goes back and he prays the second time. And look how his prayer changed. Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. See, he's already gaining strength. And now it is transitioning from, Lord, if it's possible, if there's any other way, please let it be to, well, God, if there's no other way, then I'm going to drink it. Let your will be done. And we see that, trans, that, that kind of transformation and that, that strengthening happening already as he submits himself to the Father once again. 
Then we have another interaction, verse 43. He came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And this time he just left. He left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Now, before we continue, I just want to read. I told you this was in um, some of the other Gospels, too. And the Gospel of Luke also gives an account of this story. And there's a couple of, uh, couple of distinct differences that Luke gives us that I want to share with you as we get ready to close. I see we're about that time. Um, for one, Luke doesn't give us this breakdown in this interaction. Luke's, Luke's account is shorter. But Luke says when they came to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him, that starting in verse 40, and when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And this is a big one here. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And so Luke tells us that God sent an angel at some point in this interaction in the garden to come and minister to him, to strengthen him, to encourage him, to strengthen his spirit. And because Luke gives us a shorter account and he doesn't give us this breakdown, I often wonder, when did God send the angel to Jesus? And I don't know the answer to that. This is Pastor Drew's opinion, but I think it happened right here. I think that he told his disciples to pray as he went the first time to pray. I think he came back and he found them asleep and he woke them up and he said, wake up, watch and pray, at least you fall into temptation. And I think he went and prayed the second time. And then when he came back and he found them asleep again and didn't say anything to them, he just left them be and went back to pray the third time. I think that's the moment that God said, when everybody else fails you, I will not fail you. And I will send an angel there to minister to you. And that's just my opinion. I have no, um, no evidence for that. It's just really my life experience that God is the only person who has never failed me and never let me down. And I imagine that being the same here with the Father towards the Son. And so it says in verse 43, He came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Now this is an interesting one, because this is a passage that no translations really agree upon. And depending on what you're reading right now out there, um, you will question, uh, well, you'll question my translation if it's different. Because what we see in the text is Jesus, within two verses, says, sleep on now and take your rest. And then immediately in verse 26, rise, let us be going. And they seem contradictory. Now, some of your translations may not have that first part as a statement, but as a question. And it'll ask, especially I know NIV is like that. Um, it starts with the question, something along the lines of, are you still sleeping? And now I can tell you that Really, it's debatable, and different translations say it different ways because we don't really know exactly what he meant here. I can tell you that in the original languages, it is, it is written just if you have a perfect word-for-word -word translation, it, it aligns more with a, a statement and kind of send like this, but there's nuance there. It could be kind of uh, an ironic statement from Jesus. It could be spoken with a tone of a small rebuke as he is saying, 
sleep on now and take your rest. You know, kind of uh, ironically or sarcastically, behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. It could mean that. Or I believe personally that he is being genuine here when he's saying, take your physical rest for the time that you can get it. But the time has come. However you look at it, spiritually, what we see is their time for preparation, their time for prayer, their time to strengthen the spirit so the spirit can overcome the flesh. That time is over. That's the key takeaway, is they waited too long. And that, yeah, physically may, they may feel rested, but spiritually they are weak. And so he says, you can take your rest. But behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And then he tells them, rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. See, at the end of this passage, as we have these interactions back and forth, Jesus is telling them to wake up and rise because the time is at hand and those people are coming. And we'll talk more about that next week as we get into that section as he interacts with the soldiers. But what we see is Jesus is fully prepared. He went from a place of deep sorrow to being the calm one in the situation. To being the one that's telling Peter, no, put your sword away. It's okay. This must be done. As he is further submitting himself to the Father's will. And as he is submitting himself to his eventual crucifixion and the weight of all of our sins coming upon his shoulders. And now his spirit is strengthened enough to face that head on while his disciples, who failed to watch and failed to pray, who he had to then wake up to say, well, this time has come, this thing that you are unprepared for is here, and they are going to scatter. There's a lesson for us to learn from both of them, isn't there? This is a serious, heavy tone as we reflect on the garden and Jesus' prayers. Let us all just continue to remember that posture of prayer, falling on our face in front of God and submitting ourselves to his will, despite how uncomfortable it may be for us. Because let me tell you, it was very, very uncomfortable for Jesus. But not my will be done but yours. Will you pray with me as we close? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this message. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your example. Lord, I'm sorry that you had to face that kind of sorrow. And I'm sorry that you had to face everything that we're about to study because of me, because of us. You are an awesome, awesome God. You deserve every bit of praise that we can give you. And Lord, on top of all of that, Lord Jesus, thank you this week for being our good example. Lord, help us all to have that kind of heart and that kind of posture of prayer. Lord, help us, to, help us all to have that kind of humility as we lay ourselves at the mercy of God as we submit ourselves to his will. And Lord, and as we just say, not my will be done, but yours. Lord, help us in those moments when the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And help the spirit overcome. We just lift this up. We ask this in your precious holy name.